Shabbat Shalom. Welcome. This is Sharon Cluck at Mind Messiah Ministries in Farmington, Missouri. And we're just thrilled to be together today. We're just happy to have a Shabbat and to be together, to be in a place where even though it's been uh, three digit temperatures, that we actually have air to keep us cool. And we're grateful for that. And we thank the Lord that he blesses us and gives us an opportunity to enjoy his Sabbath. We are in the 36th floor portion today, and it is pronounced, it looks like it's really hard. Look at it, it looks so long and hard. It means when you step up, but it's pronounced this way. Beha alaka. Beha alaka. Arloka, yeah. Beha alaka. So that's how it's pronounced. That means when you set up. And he's talking about when you set up the tabernacle and the menorah. And so we're going to look at some things about the menorah. And in this, we're going to take a little side trip with it today as well. It comes out of Numbers 8, and it goes through 12, 16. It talks about the menorah in the tabernacle, the uh, consecration of the Levites. It talks about the second Passover and how a cloud of fire would lead the Israelites at night and how a cloud would lead them in the day. There's some really interesting things in this Torah portion about how they travel and how they set things up. Because when they get to where they're going, they know exactly where they're going to set the tabernacle up, what direction and everything, because it's where the cloud stops or where the fire stops. And they go right up underneath that cloud or right up underneath that light. And that's where they set up the tabernacle. And then all of the other uh, tribes set up all the way around them. So we have had a picture of the tabernacle on the board for several weeks. And today, this is not to scale in any way, but this morning I just threw it back up there just briefly so we could have an idea. and. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to see what I've done here. It looks like a big H, but this is actually the tabernacle, the holy place and the holy of holies. And this is supposed to be the Ark of the Covenant with two angels looking at each other. It looks like a great big H, but that's not what it's supposed to be. And I have the directions on this so that we would know which way we were coming in. And we always come in from this side, the east side, because we, when we approach God, we always have our back to the east, because that is how all the other nations serve their God is by looking at the sun and they would worship towards the east. So when we entered the tabernacle, we had our back on that. We would enter in this way. In this Torah portion, it also talks about the second Passover for those people who miss the first one because they're unclean. And we're going to learn about the trumpets and what kind of blowing that they have for each kind of gathering, if they're going to war or if they're just gathering together for a convocation or if it's Shabbat, there's a different trumpet blowing or shofar blowing for each one of them. We're going to look at that as well. And then we're going to, at the very end, have the story of Miriam and Aaron, her brother, and how they challenged Moses on his leadership. Wasn't a really good thing or smart thing to be doing. When God has an anointing on somebody, the world wants to challenge that person often. And we're going to see what happens to people who try to bring down a man of God. So Aaron is commanded to raise up a light in the lamp of the menorah. And that the tribe of Levi is initiated into the service in the sanctuary because they're the ones that are going to help out with the carrying from place to place and the maintenance of it and the setting up and all of the elements that has to do with the sanctuary. Then the second pass Passover is instituted in response to somebody's petition that says, why should we be deprived? They want to be able to bring their gifts to the Lord. They count it a privilege to be able to be part of this Passover. It's a, a momentous event, and it's a joyful thing. 
but if they're unclean for any reason, they can't participate. So for that reason, then Moses approaches God and we learn about the second Passover. Then God instructs Moses on the procedures for Israel's journey and the encampments in the desert. And then the people journey in a formation from Mount Sinai where they have been camped for nearly a year. So we have been looking at this whole thing, but this has been almost a whole year that they have been at the foot of Mount Sinai. So now they are ready to start moving towards taking the land that God has promised them. In this Torah portion, we see that the people are dissatisfied with their bread from heaven, the manna. And if you remember that Jesus said that he was the manna from the heaven, and they were dissatisfied with that. It wasn't enough for them. So they demand from Moses that he supply them with meat, like, okay. And Moses appoints, ends up appointing 70 elders to help him with all these people because he can't handle all of it. And he imparts part of his spirit to these 70 elders that will assist him in the burden of governing the people. And then Miriam speaks negatively of Moses, and she's punished with the curse of leprosy. Moses ends up praying for her healing, and the entire community will wait seven days for her recovery before they move on. So that, in a nutshell, is what we're going to look at today. So some of the things that we want to pay our attention to, and that is that there is only one true God. We talked a little bit before we started this morning about the power of darkness and how we have got to know our God. Daniel said that those who know their God will do exploits. That's who we expect to be and to become in these last days, that we are not run over by the spirit of darkness, but that we will be those who know our God. There is only one true God. In the scriptures, you will see multiple gods named. In our current society, we will hear of multiple gods that are being worshipped. The truth about that is, is that every one of those gods can be historically traced right back to one entity, and that is Satan himself. So you can call him whatever you want but it's still the spirit of darkness and Satan is behind every one of them. So it is a battle between two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. There is only one true God. His name is yod Hey vav Hey, and he sent his son Yeshua to be the once and for all final sacrifices for our sins. And then we need to be able to return to his Torah, his instructions, that most of us have spent a lifetime not knowing or understanding. And we're supposed to have a love for the land. We plan to live there in the kingdom. And it would be a good thing to understand and know the rule of that kingdom. So we want to learn the instructions of the land. We're going to live there if we are faithful to the end and we live this life where we don't, if we don't expire, this flesh doesn't die before the coming of Yeshua, then we will spend that time with him in the millennial reign, in Jerusalem, in the land. So often a person wants to inherit everything the Bible says or promises to Abraham's seed, but not the instructions on how we're supposed to live in the land. We want the land, we want the promises, we, we want the land of milk and honey, we want all the blessings, but we don't always want the instructions on how to live in the land. So we want to have the blessings of Abraham without keeping the covenant of Abraham. Isn't that convenient? So one day, according to Jeremiah 31, the Torah will be written on our hearts. That is the new covenant, is that the Torah is written on our hearts. And the only way that that happens is that we are forgiven of our sins through the blood of Yeshua. So we're going to begin to read uh, Numbers 8. 
And Adonai said to Moshe, so I'm reading out of the uh, complete Jewish Bible today. Tell Aharon, when you set up the lamps or the menorah, the seven lamps are to cast their light forward in front of the menorah. And Aaron did this. He lit his lamps so as to give light in front of the menorah as Adonai had ordered Moshe. And here's how the menorah was made. So let's pause there a minute and let's look at my little diagram here on the board. We have here the Holy of Holies. Outside of that is the table of incense. We've talked about that. The coals come off of this altar and they're taking back to the uh, table of incense. On this side, you have the menorah. It's just seven lamps on one stand. And over here, you have the table of showbread. So when that light shows forth, forward, it is shining on the bread. There are 12 loaves of bread there, and they are representing the 12 tribes of Israel. But more than that, it is Yeshua that they represent because he is the bread of life. He is our bread, the word of God. It says in the beginning that the, the, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and that there was nothing made without the word, that Jesus is the word. So when we look at the bread of life, he is the word and that's what this table of showbread represents the light will shine upon that. So before we go into how it's made, let's look at a couple other things. We also have, first we have the altar here. This is the altar of, of burnt offerings. And then we have the laver and then the holy place with the menorah, the bread and the incense, and then the holy of holies. We talked about this before, that at the entrance, you have Moses and Aaron and the tribe of Judah with Judah are two other tribes. The reason that we believe that's set up that way is that to enter into the place where you will ultimately come to God's presence, you first have to go through Yeshua. Yeshua was a prophet as unto Moses. He was the high priest. He is eternally our high priest from the book of Hebrews. And that is an image or a shadow or a type of Aaron, who is also at this entrance. And then he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, who has the kingship. So all of those tribes are the ones that are here at the entrance. When we go into the tabernacle is the offering where we accept the blood offering, which is Yeshua. Once we have accepted that blood offering for our sins to be forgiven through the blood of the lamb, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, then we, most all of us are baptized in water. We are washed clean. We're washed and we put the word in so that we can have the renewing of our mind. And that's what's represented by this labor. We put the word in which the showbread represents. We put the word in, and as we pray, it's like incense. It tells us in the book of Revelations that our prayers are as incense and that they're being kept in a vial for a final judgment. Every one of your prayers are precious to God, and they're held before him in the holy place in heaven. And then we have the menorah here. So when you put the word of God in, when you are giving your prayers up, if you receive the sacrifice, you're cleansed by the washing of his word, you're putting the word into yourself, you're offering up prayers, then you become what Jesus said. He said that you are the light of the world, that you have become the light of the world, that you're like a city, that you are like the light on the top of the city that it's not hidden, that you're a beacon for others. And that's what we're supposed to become. He tells us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the father. 
So what's most important for us to feed this physical body or our spiritual body? Our spiritual mind, our spiritual soul is an eternal being. And we spend much more time feeding our flesh the things that we desire and we want and we pamper it way more than we take time in the word feeding our spirit. Our physical body are our spiritual man. That's our choice. So the light of the menorah shines on the bread of life, which is the word. So how can we be the light to the world? It's, it's to live out the commandments. When we do that, we represent Yeshua. He was perfect in every way. He kept every commandment. He was a perfect sacrifice. And he said we were supposed to take up our crosses and follow him. To be disciples of Jesus is to watch him and do as he did. If he didn't do it, don't do it. And if he did do it, do do it. So now we're going to look at how that menorah is made in that next verse. Verse four. Here is how the menorah was made. It was hammered gold. This is verse four. From its base to its flowers. Hammered work. Following the pattern Ed and I had shown Moshe. And this is how he made the menorah. So he's following a pattern that he's seen. God showed him what it looked like in the heavenlies. And now he is going to replicate. So this is how it's made. The menorah is hammered gold. It's one piece of solid gold and has been hammered. It, is, it has wicks in it that we learned are from the garments, the used garments of the priesthood. They're twisted and used for wicks. That represents man's humanity. It has oil flowing through it, and that represents the power of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about our life, somebody posted today that on Facebook that God is not trying us, that God is not crushing us. And so there's a teaching out there that God crushes the oil, crushes the olives, and gets everybody oil out of them and produces. Uh, the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, they say, but my God doesn't do that. My God loves you and he doesn't, he doesn't crush you. And so I just simply answered them back that um, every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of, of lights and there's no shadow of turning in him. So yes, every good and perfect gift comes down from the father. On the other hand, he also says that he chastens his own and he scourges every son that he accepts. He disciplines us is what that's saying. He's not crushing us. He's disciplining us. So when we look at this menorah that's hammered gold, he tells us that we're going to be, we're going to shine like gold and that we are, are also having things in our life that need to be hammered up. None of us are perfect. And it takes discipline from a loving father to bring us to the place where we can shine and be the light of the Lord. So now we're going to look over, before we go on, we're going to look over at Zechariah 4, verse 1. And the angel that talked with me came again, and he waked me. This is Zechariah speaking, as a man that had awakened out of his sleep. So this is part of our Torah portion. This is a half Torah. And he said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold, a candlestick of gold with bowls upon the top of it and seven lamps thereon. And I see pipes in the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Well, he's describing a menorah. It's the same thing that we see in the book of Revelations when John sees Yeshua walking among the churches. They're represented by menorahs. They're supposed to be bringing out light. They're supposed to be shining. So verse three, and then he says, so he sees this big menorah, and then I see two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I drew a little sketch down here. I have a great big old menorah and two trees. And what we see is that these are olive trees and the menorah is getting light 
from both sides of the menorah from these trees. And I answered and I spake to the angel that talked with me saying, what are these my Lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and he said unto me, knowest thou not what these be? And he said, no, my Lord. At the top of these, we're looking at almond wood where they've got the, the flowers. And it's the first to blossom. It's the first to bear fruit in the land. And Yeshua is our first fruits from among many brothers. We are first fruits in a sense because we are a generation that is accepting the commandments of Yahweh and the testimony of Yeshua. So I told you about the wicks and how within this menorah are wicks that have to pick up the light. They pick up the oil and then they are ignited from the light. Next to it are these two olive trees. Olive trees are dripping oil down into the menorah. There are two trees, and this is why we believe there's two trees, because Israel is divided. You have Israel always represented by an olive tree, but Israel is divided. So you have an olive tree of Judah and Benjamin, and you have an olive tree of 10 tribes, which is considered Ephraim. One of them represents keeping the commandments of Yahweh, and the other represents keeping the testimony of Yeshua. And we see that in the book of Revelations 12. So this is my question. If this is the two houses of Judah and Ephraim, who are the two witnesses in the book of Revelations? Huh? Moses would be one. Well, we believe Elijah. everybody thinks it's Moses and Elijah. But I'm putting this to you because I think maybe we need to think further. What if, what if the light of the world is being represented by the two houses that have done both, kept the commandments of Yahweh and the testimony of Yeshua, according to Revelations 12. Is it possible that the two witnesses are not two individual people? Is it possible that the two witnesses are represented by the 10 lost tribes, actually the whole house of Israel? something to think about. So there's two trees because Israel's divided. Judah kept the oral Torah with Benjamin, and the other tree is Ephraim, which represents the 10 tribes. We preserved the living Torah, and uh, I'm sorry, we as Ephraim, we preserved the living Torah, which is Yeshua. Yeshua is the one who lived out the Torah, and we represent him are the 10 lost tribes. And they became the Irish, the Germans, they went to Denmark, they became Christianity, even with all of its paganism. In 1492, Columbus, who was a Jew, he and many came to the United States, what we know as the United States now. And we became the living Torah, which is Yeshua. So what John saw in the book of Revelations was seven menorahs. It was a called out believers in Messiah. So we already know that, that the menorahs that he sees in the book of Revelations are people who are serving Yeshua. They're what we call the seven churches, mm -hmm. but they're called out believers in Messiah. And many of them were uh, those that were keeping the commandments of Yahweh they were from the Hebrew nation who had come and found faith in Yeshua. This was not a new religion. This was the same religion. They still served Yahweh. They still kept the commandments of Yahweh, but now they have a Messiah who has given them a way to be redeemed from what we're calling the law 
which the law was not nailed to the tree, but it's the enmity to the law that was nailed to the tree. It is all the things that we had to do and required to do to get our sins forgiven. Now Yeshua is nailed to the tree and he is a once for all sacrifice and our sins can only be forgiven through him and what he has done for us. We preserve the living Torah, Yeshua. And we don't know if we are part of the 10 lost tribes or not. Most people don't know. So what John saw in the book of Revelations was the seven menorahs. It was a called out believers, Messiah. So you see, we have no light of our own. Even if we were hammered out like a beautiful menorah, we would have no light of our own. We have only the light of the Holy Spirit. We are attempting to keep the law of Messiah by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's no way for us to continue to do all the things that God has expected us to. Israel failed for decades, for centuries. But through Yeshua, we can keep the testimony of Yeshua and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can attempt to be Torah observant and to attempt to keep the commandments of Yahweh. There were people who kept them perfectly. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they kept them perfectly. So it wasn't like it was impossible. Yeshua kept them. Our fulfillment of prophecy that in the day he will gather all of us back. In Hebrews 11, all the men of faith did not see what you and I are seeing today. We're seeing things that they could only, they couldn't even understand what these prophecies were about. We're looking at them and they're unfolding in front of us every single day. We're learning our true identity, who we were created to be so that we can be a true menorah, that we can bring light to others. That's the whole point that we can bring the light of Yeshua to others. And then we will live out our destiny and our call. That's what we're here for, is to be servants of the Most High God. We identify with the Spirit of God, with Yeshua. And we wanna keep our eyes on him so that we can reflect his power and his light, just like the moon reflects the light of the sun. We're supposed to be reflecting the light of our Savior, Yeshua. We're not to judge others that don't see what we have already seen. Our goal is to bring people to the word, to uplift, and to inspire them. Not to judge them. So the two anointed ones from Judah and Ephraim are two olive trees. Here's a few things about the olive trees. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. He's talking to us. Yeshua's talking to his disciples. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. And it gives light to everyone in the whole house. That's what we're supposed to be doing, bringing light to everyone in our house, in our household, in our families, our acquaintances. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. Well, if you have no works, nobody else can see them. We want to do our part to reconcile and unify both houses, these two. We wanna see that come together. Yeshua said in Matthew, I'm sorry, uh, John 17, Father, I want them to be one as we are one. That was his last recorded prayer that we had. And Jesus is not a pagan God, but he's a Jewish Messiah. However, we have to understand where the Christian world is coming from as well. We were there. We know where they're coming from. So in Acts 13, 47, it says, I have made you a light to the Gentiles. That's what we are. 
For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light for the Gentile, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. So when we're talking about the menorah, we're supposed to be relating to that, that just as it gives light, we are to give light. And he spoke this in Isaiah, and he told Israel that they were a light to the Gentiles. Now it's spoken to Paul and Barnabas. So the word salvation, the word salvation is Yeshua in the Hebrew. They're showing forth the light of Messiah to the lost tribes or the Gentiles. That's at the time when they were talking about Gentiles, they're talking about the 10 lost tribes. They had gone into the world and they had lost their identity. So who is that? Well, it's the lost tribes of Israel. And Jacob prophesied over Ephraim to be many nations. And that was back in the book of Genesis. Let me read that to you. Genesis 48, 19. This is key. And his father refused. If you remember, he crossed his hands over. He was blessing the boys. He crosses his hands over. And Joseph said, no, father, you, you have to bless Manasseh first. And, Joseph, and, and Jacob answers back. And his father refused. And he said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people. And he shall be great. But truly, this younger brother shall be greater than he. And his seed shall become a multitude of nations. So when we look at all the nations on the earth, many of them are Ephraim. So that you may be salvation is what he said to them. So that you may, you're the light and you're supposed to bring salvation. Well, you're supposed to bring Yeshua. The word for salvation is Yeshua to the ends of the world. And then in 1 Peter 2, 9, Israel is a chosen race. That's basically marriage language. He called them out of darkness. So we went into the world and we learned lies. And now he is calling you out of darkness and back into his light. We've all learned lies according to Jeremiah. This is what it says in 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're a peculiar people that we are. That you should show forth the praises of him. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Showing forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In 1 John 5, 1. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And we declare unto you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. There's not supposed to be any darkness in us. We are to be imitators of Yeshua. And he's calling us out of darkness into light. Before we started today, we talked about some of the things in the kingdom of darkness that we're learning about and how people can only be set free through the power and the blood of Yeshua. There is no other way. The kingdom of darkness is operating simultaneously right alongside the kingdom of light. We are the children of light. We are the children of Yahweh through the blood of Jesus. But there are the seed of the serpent that are still in the land. And we know that because of the parable of the wheat and the tares. They will be gathered up in the end days. So there's no darkness. Psalms 119, 101 says, the word is a lamp unto my feet. That's what the word of God is. It's light. And it's a light unto my path. As the light in the darkness, we shine the light on the word of God. If we don't have a word to back up the things that we say, then we're not being biblical. We need to have the word to back up what we are saying. Proverbs 6, 23, the commandment is a lamp. That's what the commandment is. We know about the, the virgins that showed up and had no oil in their lamp. This one says, 
that the commandment is the lamp itself. The teaching is a light. This is right out of scripture, Proverbs 6.23. It calls the Gentiles back home. Discipline is a way of life. So this is how it reads. The commandment is a lamp. The law is a light. And the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. So God may not be crushing us, but he instructs us and he reproves us when we get out of line. For the commandment is a lamp. So in order to have oil, you have to have a lamp. And the law is a light. There has to be something in there to make that lamp give forth light. So let's go back to this Torah portion. Since we have thoroughly talked about the menorah and the light and who is the light of the world and that we are supposed to be following after him. It says, take the, the Levites from among the people that are Israel and cleanse them. Here is how you are to cleanse them. Sprinkle the purification water on them. Have them shave their whole body with a razor, their whole body. And have them wash their clothes and cleanse themselves. And then they are to take a young bull with its grain <laughs> offering, which is to be fine flour mixed with olive oil, while you take another bull for a sin offering. When you think about that, that we are the wheat in the end times, and we are mixed with the oil of the Holy Spirit. And we have a sweet smelling fragrance of of uh, frankincense are the smell. Our prayers are sweet smelling prayer or fragrance unto God. So when God gathers that wheat, those of us that have been, I don't want to say the word crushed, but that's how they make fine flour, we will be presented to Yahweh with our prayers and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 11, and Aaron will offer the Levite before Adonai as a wave offering from the people of Israel so that they may be to Adonai service. So it's like somehow he is waving the whole tribe of Levi. Remember, we counted how many of those were, a lot. And the Levite may lay their hands on the heads of the bulls and the one will offer as a sin offering and the other a burnt offering to Adonai to make atonement for the Levites. You are to place the Levites before Aaron and his sons and offer them as a wave offering unto Adonai. In this way, you will separate the Levites from the people of Israel and the Levites will belong to me. God wants them separated. We are supposed to be separated. We are called to be kings and priests unto our God. And we are to be a separated people, different than others. After that, the Levites will enter and do the service of the tent of meeting. And you will cleanse them and offer them as a wave offering. Because, because they are entirely given to me from among the people of Israel. Have I taken them for myself in place of those who come first out of the womb? That is the firstborn male of the people of Israel. For all the firstborn among the people of Israel are mine, both humans and animals. On the day I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I set them apart for myself. Remember, the, those in Egypt, all of the firstborn of animal and people died. But God set these aside. He spared them for himself. Now he's taking the Levites in the place of the firstborn. But I have taken the Levites in place of all the firstborn among the people of Israel. And I have given the Levites to Aaron and his sons from among the people of Israel to do the service of the people of Israel in the tent of meeting and to make atonement for the people of Israel so that no plague will fall 
on the people of Israel in consequence of their coming too close to the sanctuary. So these people, these Levites are set aside. They've gone through anointing. They're, they are designated people who can come into the tabernacle and do the work of the tabernacle. Others are not permitted to do that. If you remember that we learned early in other Torah portions that if people wanted to make themselves, uh, what was the word, how did it say? If they wanted to, um, anyway, it was if you wanna get involved with what the Levites are doing, well, death may be the consequence because what I'm giving them to do is holy. You have to be the one that is holy to do the holy things of God. It's the same way today. We who have been anointed and covered by the blood of Yeshua, we are set apart to do the holy things of God. We are called to be kings and priests unto our God. This is what Moses and Aaron and all the community of the people of Israel did to the Levites. And the people of Israel acted in accordance with everything that Adonai had ordered Moses in regard to the Levites. And the Levites purified themselves and they washed their clothes. And then Aaron offered them as a holy gift before Adonai and made atonement for them in the order to cleanse them. And after that, the Levites came to do their service in the tent of meeting in front of Aaron and his sons. And they acted in accordance with, the, with what Adonai ordered Moses to regard in regards to the uh, Levim or the Levites. And Adonai said to Moshe, here are instructions concerning the Levites. When they reach the age of 25, they are to begin performing the duties serving in the tent of meeting. If you remember, we talked about between 25 and 30, they are being trained. They begin actual service at 30, just like Yeshua began his ministry at 30. And when they reach the age of 50, they are to stop performing the work and not serve any longer. This is difficult work. It is not necessarily easy. And they will assist their brothers who are performing their duties in the tent of meeting, but they themselves will not do any work. This is what you are to do with the Levites in regard to their duties. So they cleanse the Levite and everything that we read for them is also for us. We are kings and priests. We are set aside. Their clothing always indicates your character. I think that's very interesting. We could tell when we see people out in public a lot about their character by what they have on, if they're, what their hair color is, and uh, if they have piercings all over their body, if they're tattooed all over their body or, or whatever. And, you know, I've, I've seen people that have these things and if you look at them and they go, what are you looking at? Well, my late husband used to say, if they ever ask him, what are you looking at? He would always say, you, isn't that why you did that to yourself? So I would look at you. <laughs> oh boy. So our clothing will reflect our character. Everything they have the priest to do is similar to the Nazarite vow. So this is what I talked about a little bit ago. The grain offering. We are the wheat harvest at the end of the age. We are ground down into fine flour, but we are to be unified. And so to be unified takes the oil. You take fine flour, it will just fly out in the air when you throw it up. But if you put the oil with it, the olive oil represents the Holy Spirit, which always brings unity. It's scented with frankincense and it is a sweet smell to our God. Yahweh. And so he's actually waving all of these Levites in an offering before him. It was Yahweh's intention for the firstborn that they would be priests. But after the sin of the golden calf, the Levite was the only one who did not bow their knee to this golden calf. And so God cannot be formed into an image. You can't take 
an image and say, this is my God. God is not an image. God is a spirit. In Egypt, the bull, Aphis, was being worshipped. And if we look at the Paleo Hebrew alphabet, you'll see that the Alif, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, it actually looks like a bull. And so people could have mistakenly thought, well, you know, maybe this bull would also represent Yahweh. There's a lot of speculation about what that could have meant. It actually looks like um, the paleo Ali kind of looks like this. And so they, they would look at that and say, well, you know, that would look like a bull. That's some people's reasoning. We have no idea if that's what it was or not. So after the golden calf, they wanted to worship God, but they didn't want to do it God's way. They wanted to do it their own way. Like Nadab and Abihu, who offered up strange fire. They were, assimil they were assimilated prior to their departure from Egypt. They had assimilated in Egypt. And after all the time that they spent there, they had actually kept Shavuot up until the time of Moses. And after that, they stopped doing it. So one of the things we learned from that is that if we don't keep God's holy days, like the Sabbath and all the festivals, the people will divide and they will forget who they are. And that's exactly what's happened in our country. We don't really know who we are. We keep days that have been set up by other gods instead of the days that are set up by God in the scriptures. So in the kingdom, Yeshua is our high priest. He is after the order of Melchizedek and is of that bloodline as well. He will be the high priest over all the Levitical priests. The Levites were waved before the Lord and they're offered as a holy gift to Yahweh. So the military service, when they took the census for military service, if you remember, they counted from 20 years and old, older, but the Levites are actually counted from one month old. What we see in that is so special because God sees your worth from your infancy, from the time he counted them for the service of the tabernacle from one month old. And then David says in the Psalms that God knew us from our mother's womb. So he has seen our value and our worth from before we were even born. So let's go into this next chapter and we're gonna learn about that second month Passover. Numbers nine, Ed and I spoke to Moshe in the Sinai desert in the first month of the second year after they had left the land of Egypt. So they're beginning the second year. And he said, let the people of Israel observe the Pesach or the Passover at the designated time. On the 14th day of this month at dusk, you are to observe it at its designated time. You are to observe it according to all its regulations and rules. Moses told the people of Israel to observe the Pesach or Passover. So they observed Passover at dusk on the 14th day of the month in the desert, the Sinai desert. And the people of Israel acted in accordance with all that Adonai had ordered Moshe. But there were certain people who had become unclean because of somebody's corpse so that they could not observe Passover on that day. So they came before Moses and Aaron that day. And they said to him, we are unclean because of, of somebody's corpse. Why must we keep from bringing the offering to Adonai at the time designated for the people of Israel? And Moses answered them, wait, so that I can hear what Adonai will order concerning you. I told you this before. You know, it tells us in the scriptures that those who wait upon the Lord renew their strength. So often we feel like that we have to give an answer as soon as somebody asks us a question. We do not. It is so much better to say, let me consider this. Let me pray about it. Let me see what the word says. 
oftentimes our first answer that we respond with will get us into trouble because then we got to come back and correct it because God didn't say that. Even Moses himself had to go to see what God was going to say. So Adonai says to Moses, tell the people of Israel, if any of you now or in the future generations is unclean because of a carbs or if he is on a trip abroad, nevertheless, he is to observe the Passover. But if he will observe it in the second month on the 14th day at dusk, they are to eat it with matzah and mora, bitter herbs. And they are to leave none of it until the morning and they are not to break any of its bones. Why don't they break the bones of the lamb? I'm sorry? Because Yeshua is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and not one bone was broken on Yeshua. This lamb represents Yeshua. And they're supposed to eat it with Mara. We know that, that uh, that's bitter herbs and the bitterness represents the bitterness of the crucifixion and of sin and of slavery. And then the matzah represents the unleavened bread, which means there was no sin in our sacrifice. They are to leave none of it until the morning and they are not to break any of its bones. They are to observe it according to all the regulations of the Pesach or the Passover. But the person who is clean and not on a trip who fails to observe the Passover will be cut off from his people. That's really serious. That's how important it is for them to remember. Because he did not bring the offering for Adonai at his designated time. We are on uh, uh, chapter 9, 13. So they did not bring the uh, offering for Adonai on its designated time that people bear the consequences of that sin. So God has designated times. You didn't get to do this on the time that you wanted to do it. If you couldn't make it that day, you couldn't come the next day. You had to wait until God said, okay, here's the second schedule. If you didn't make it the first time, you can come this time. He meets us in these festivals, in these appointed times, he will meet with us. So they couldn't just pick and choose, well, I didn't get to go yesterday, I'll go today. God has designated times. Verse 14, if a foreigner is staying with you and he wants to observe Passover of Adonai, he is to do it according to the regulations and the rules of, of Passover. You are to have the same law for the foreigner as the citizen of the land. So we know from this that foreigners could participate in the Passover. On the day the tabernacle was put up, the cloud covered the tabernacle. That is the tent of testimony. And in the evening over the tabernacle was what appeared to be fire, which remained until morning. So the cloud always covered it and it looked like fire at night. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tent, the people of Israel continued their travels and they camped wherever the cloud stopped. At the order of Adonai, the people of Israel, they traveled and at the order of Adonai, they camped. And as long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they stayed in camp. Even when the cloud remained on the tabernacle for a long time, the people of Israel did what Adonai had charged them to do, and they did not travel. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle, according to Adonai's order, and they remained in camp. According to Adonai's order, they traveled. Sometimes the cloud was there only from evening until morning. Can you imagine all that tearing down and putting up and tearing down and putting up for just one day or overnight so that when the cloud was taken up in the morning, they traveled again. Or even if it continued up both day and night, when the cloud was up, they just kept traveling. They traveled day and night. 
I think that's amazing. Whether it be two days, a month of a year, that the cloud remained over the tabernacle, staying on it, the people of Israel remained in camp and they did not travel. But as soon as it was taken up, they did travel. At Adonai's order, the camp, and Adonai's order, they traveled. They did what Adonai had charged them to do through Moses. Wow. Okay. When we look at the New Testament, we see the Apostle Paul. He's always going back to Jerusalem. He's got to get back for this feast, or he's got to get back for that feast. So even after the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, Paul is still making sure that he's going back to Jerusalem for all of these festivals. And he has to get back, and he has to be on time, because God has a designated time. And you know, we're not even sure what these days are. We're not even sure about the calendar. That's why we try to follow along with the barley that's aviv or ripe in Israel so we can be as close as we possibly can. We used to have the problem with the new moon, knowing when a new moon celebration is. So God has designated times and you and I are doing the very best we can to meet with him on those designated times. He is our future husband. We are a future bride, talking about Yeshua, and we are trying to meet with him when he says that he's coming, we want to be ready. We want to have oil in our lamp and we want to be prepared. Okay, so that's why they had the second Passover, so that if you couldn't make it the first time, you could do it the second time according to God's law. He had the same law for everyone. Even if you're not a Hebrew and you're in Israel and you want to participate, you do exactly as they do. And God loved these people. He wanted to be among the people, but his power was too astounding, amazing. And so he had to constantly cover himself and he clothed himself or veiled himself in a cloud. And then when he when he had his presence in the Holy of Holies, he would also have them to bring an incense to make the cloud even thicker. He was always behind the veil and that veil was really thick. The cloud would go ahead and then Judah would be the first. So the, Judah would go out first, the cloud would go, go first and then Judah would be the first one to follow the tribe of Judah and those that were with Judah. And then they would erect the tabernacle under the cloud when they when the cloud stopped. So Yahweh could actually look ahead and see what kind of danger they were going into. He could either prevent it or he could keep them in one place until something moved out of the way. Be yes, avoid it. And it's just like I've drawn that on the, on the board numerous times. So it's like a parade. You know, if we're standing here watching the parade, we're watching everything that's going by us, but we can't see what came before and we can't see what's coming in the future. But God, God sees all of the parade. He sees your whole life. He knows when you're in danger. He sends angels to get you out of a situation. That's why we wait on him. We listen to him. We trust his voice. We trust his word. Yahweh could see what was ahead and he would prevent them from what was ahead by just staying put. And then they didn't move until he could say it was safe for them to move forward. So we're to wait on him as well and to not move until he says so. Isaiah 40, 31, we're all familiar with this one, but they that wait, and that means exactly what it says, you wait in his presence, you attend to him, you listen to him. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. You wanna be renewed, set in the presence of the Lord. You wanna be empowered? I'm talking to me too. Spend more time sitting in the presence of the Lord. 
They shall mount up with wings like eagles and they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Some of us just want to walk. And I'd like to walk and not faint. I mean, we've had such heat here lately that just going outside is enough to catch your breath. So let's move on. We're going to read 10. Numbers chapter 10. Make two trumpets. Make them of hammered silver and use them for summoning the community and for sounding the call to break camp and to move on. So the trumpet was sounded to bring everybody together. The trumpet was sounded in a different way to get them to move forward, to get ready to move. When they are sounded, the entire community is to assemble before you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So when there is a, a shofar blown, they're supposed to come to the tent of meeting, to the beginning of it, to the entrance of it. If only one is sounded, then just the leaders, the heads of the clans of Israel are to assemble before you. When you sound an alarm, the camp to the east will commence traveling. That's Judah. When you sound a second alarm, the camp to the south will set, will set up and will sound alarm to announce when to travel. So it was first the east, and then the next one was to the south. And then seven, verse seven, however, when the community is to be assembled, you are to sound, but don't sound an alarm. So don't make it sound like an alarm. It will be the sons of Aaron, the uh, Kohanim, or the, the, the Kohats, the Levites, who are to sound, the priests, I should say, the trumpet. And this will be a permanent regulation for you through all generations. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who is oppressing you, you are to sound an alarm with the trumpets. And then you will be remembered before Yahweh, your Adonai. And you will be saved from your enemies. That's why I love the sounding of the shofar. When we blow that shofar, sometimes we're going into spiritual battle and we need to blow that shofar. I need to learn to blow that thing because we're calling the angels, we're calling the presence of God to come in and to battle for us. He said, when you sound it, you will remind him and he will come and fight for you. That's exactly what we need the Lord to do. Also, on your days of rejoicing, at your, again, designated times on Rosh Kodesh, you are to sound the trumpet over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And there will be your reminder before God that I am Adonai. You sound these trumpets to remind yourself who God is. And on the 20th day of the second month in the second year, the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle of the testimony. And the people of Israel moved out in stages from the Sinai desert and the cloud stopped in Paran desert. And so they set out on the first journey in keeping with Adonai's order through Moshe. In the lead was a banner of the camp of the descendants of Judah, Yehuda, whose companies moved forward over the companies, over the company of the tribe of the descendants of Issachar, Tenel, the son of Tezar. Over the company of the descendants of Zebulon was Alevab, the son of Hilan. And then the tabernacle was taken down. So first the trumpet is sounded and then Judah moves out. So first the cloud moves, the trumpet sounded, Judah moves out. And then the tabernacle is taken down and the descendants of Gershon, which are Moses' sons, and the descendants of Mariari set out carrying the tabernacle. So they're beginning to carry the tabernacle. Next, the banner of the camp of Reuben moved forward by company over the company of the tribe of the descendants of Simeon, 
was Shiloel, the son of Tershadiah. Over the company of the descendants of Gad was Eliasa, son of Duel. And then the descendants of, so 21, the descendants of Koa set up carrying the sanctuary so that at the next camp, the tabernacle could be set up before they arrived. The banner of the camp of the descendants of Ephraim moved forward by companies. Over the company of the tribe of the descendants of Manasseh was Gamiel. Over the company of the descendants of Benjamin or Benjamin was Abaddon. The banner of the camp of the descendants of Dan formed the rear guard for all the camps. So that Dan is all the way in the back. Over the company of the tribe of the descendants of Asher was Pegilel, the son of Okren. And over the company of the descendants of Naphtali was Acria, the son of Ehan. This is how the people of Israel traveled by companies. Thus they moved forward. And Moses said to Hobab, Hobab, okay. And Moses said to Hobab, the son of Raul, the Midianite, this is the father-in-law of Moses, who has come, if you remember, he came and brought his wife and children. We are traveling to the place about which Ed and I said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will treat you well because Ed and I has promised good things to Israel. When I think that they ended up in the wilderness 40 years, it's probably good he didn't go with them. But he replied, I will not go. I would rather go back to my own country and to my own kinsmen. And Moshe continued, please don't leave us because we know that you have to camp in the desert and you can be as our eyes. He knew that desert. If you do go with us, then whatsoever good that Ed and I does to us, he will do the same for you. So they set out from Adonai's mountain, which is Mount Sinai, and they traveled for three days. Ahead of them on the three-day journey went the Ark of Adonai's covenant, searching for a new place to stop. The cloud of Adonai was over them during the day as they set out from the camp. And when the ark moved forward, Moses said, arise Adonai, may your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. And when it stopped, he said, return Adonai for the many, many thousands of Israel. We have just learned how all the tribes go out. And uh, we learn more than we even wanted to know. We know who their fathers and their fathers' fathers were. But we see the order of God. He is in perfect order. He has no confusion. It's not a bunch of people just say, here are the alarms and everybody just takes off and goes. No, it's in perfect order according to what God has called us to do. He is not a God of confusion. The Bible says where there's confusion, there's every evil work. He is a God of order. He wants our lives to have order in it as well. So now we're going to look at chapter 11. Okay, so now we're going to learn about the grumbling. But the people began complaining about their hardships to Adonai. When Adonai heard it, his anger flared up so that fire from Ed and I broke out against them and consumed the outskirts. But the people, the people began complaining about their hardships to Ed and I when Ed and I heard it and the anger flared up so that the fire of Ed and I broke out against them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. You know, God really loves a, a grateful heart. And so when things aren't working so well for us, the grumbling is not the best thing to be doing. We need to be thankful for what we do have. And then the people cried to Moshe, and Moshe prayed to Adonai, and the fire was abated. I'm not sure how that fire broke out on the outskirts of the camp, or how what that looked like. That place was called Tavera, burning, because Adonai's fire broke out against them. Next, the mixed crowd. So this is a mixed crowd. If you remember, 
It's not all Hebrews. Some of the people from Egypt came with them. The mixed crowd that was with them grew greedy for an easier life, while the people of Israel, for their part, also renewed their weeping and said, if only we had the meat to eat. So it looks like to me that the mixed crowd, those that came from Egypt that were not slaves, but just came with them because they recognized the power of God, that they were the ones that started the grumbling. We have to be careful who we hang with because we will pick up that same spirit. We'll be ungrateful and unthankful. And five, and we remember the fish that we used to eat in Egypt. Oh, it cost us nothing. Only your life, only the life of your children. And the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. You talk about lusting after stuff. They're, they're envisioning this stuff. But now we're withered away. We have nothing to look at but this manna. The manna, by the way, was like coriander seed and it was white like a gum resin. Verse eight, and the people would go around gathering it and would grind it up in mills or pound it into paste with mortar and a pestle. And then they would cook it in pots and make it into loaves that tasted like cakes baked with olive oil. And when the dew settled on the camp during the night, the manna came with it. And Moses heard the people crying, family after family, each person at the entrance of his tent. Can you imagine? The anger of Adonai flared up violently and Moses was displeased. And Moses asked Adonai, why, do you, why are you treating your servants so badly? Why don't I find favor in your sight so that you put the burden of these entire people on me? Did I conceive these people? Was I their father? So that you tell me to carry them in your arms like a nurse carries a baby in the land that you swore to their ancestors? Where am I going to get meat to give this entire people? Because they keep bothering me with their crying and they're saying, give us meat to eat. I can't carry this entire people by myself alone. It's too much for me. If you're gonna treat me this way and just tell me outright, please, if you have any mercy towards me and don't let me go on being this miserable. And Ed and I said to Moses, Bring me 70 of the leaders of the Israel people and recognized as leaders of the people and officers of theirs. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them stand there with you. And I, I will come down and speak with you there. And I will take some of the spirit which rests on you and I'll put it on them. And then they will carry the burden of the people along with you so that you won't have to carry it alone. You know, most people would love to have that kind of power on them. Moses is so humble. He's grateful to get the help. Verse 18, tell the people, consecrate yourselves tomorrow and I will eat and you will eat meat. Consecrate yourself for tomorrow and you will eat meat because you cried in the ears of Adonai. If only we had meat to eat. We had the good life in Egypt. All right. Ed and I is going to give you meat and you will eat it. You won't eat it just one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nose and you hate it because you have rejected Ed and I who is here with you. I'm right here in the midst of you. And you distressed him with your crying and asking, why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses said, here, I am with 600,000 men on foot. And yet you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. If the whole flock and the herds were slaughtered for them, would it even be enough? If all the fish in the sea were collected for them, would even that be enough? And Ed and I answered Moses 
as Ed and I's arm grown short, kind of like, you think I can't do what I said I could do? Now, you will see whether what I say will happen or not. And Moses went out and he told the people what Ed and I had said. And then he collected 70 of the leaders of the people and he placed them around the tent. And Ed and they came down in the cloud, spoke to him, took some of the spirit that was on him and he put it in the 70 leaders. And when the spirit came to rest on them, they prophesied, but not afterwards. So this is the only time they're prophesying. They're not prophets like unto Moses. They're only prophesying this one time. And there were two men who stayed in the camp. One's name was Eldad and the other Medad. And the spirit came and it rested on them. And they were among those listed to go into the tent, but they hadn't done so. And they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and he told Moses, Eldad and Medad had prophesied in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, who from his youth up, had been Moses' assistant, answered, my Lord, Moses, stop them. And Moses replied, are you so zealous to protect me? I wish all of Ed and I's people were prophets. I wish Ed and I would put his spirit on all of them. Moses and the leaders of Israel went back into the camp. And Ed and I sent out a wind which brought quail from across the sea and let them fall near the camp about a day's trip away on each side of the camp and all around it, covering the ground to a depth of three feet. Yeah. And the people stayed up all day, all night, and all the next day gathering the quail. And the person gathering the least collected 10 heaps. And they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. So they've already been told by God that they're going to have enough for a month, but they're busy staying awake all day and all night, gathering these up. So they're going to hoard them. But while the meat was still in their mouth, before they had chewed it up, the anger of Ed and I flared up against the people. And Ed and I struck the people with a terrible plague. Therefore, that place was named Kivrat Hafta Ava, Graves of Greed. Because there they buried the people who were so greedy from Kithra Hatta Ava. The people traveled to Hatsarat and they stayed at Hatsarat. So fire breaks out in the camp. And they believe that this was the pillar of fire, that it just started shooting out, that the pillar of fire just started shooting out fire. Ooh, they were greedier for an easier life. So the very first sin is grumbling, discontentment. And it actually manifests as a spiritual sickness that becomes a physical disease. I learned a lot recently about these spiritual sicknesses that become a physical disease that the spirit of darkness or the kingdom of darkness are trying to put on God's people and others. We will embrace the trials to overcome all of those things in our life. They were wailing, crying out, lusting. They had a wrong emotion for, a, for an easier life. Yahweh gave them a life to perfect them. The obstacles are to lead us to a better life through the lessons that we learn. It's his refining fire. The world still has dirt in it. We're made of dirt. And so God is still refining the dirt out of us. It needs refined. So what is it that we give into? What are the things in our life that we want to be easy. They are now leaning to the flesh. God has provided for them and they want something else. Wanting the old life. They are no longer slaves. They have not, they're not having their children killed anymore, but they prefer to have the food. And that's what they long for. 
they keep looking back and saying, I want to go back to Egypt. And Moses sees them as a bunch of crybabies. You know, Jesus said that a man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. A man who puts his hand to the plow and he looks back. God's got him going somewhere, doing something. And he keeps looking back that he's not fit for the kingdom of God. We don't get to look back. We have to always look forward. And we have some dark days we may have to look forward to. We can't keep looking back and saying, I hope it goes back to the way it used to be. We have to be prepared for whatever is before us. So these 70 elders that are set up under God's authority are the origins for the Sanhedrin. And he takes a spirit from Moses, and yet the spirit that's on Moses doesn't diminish. He's not giving up anything. When we pray for somebody to impart the same anointing that we have, we're not giving up the anointing that we have. We're asking God for our unequal anointing, our anointing like that on somebody else. Yeah, we can give love. You're right. God has inexhaustible supplies of his spirit and of his love. And these will always, there will always be enough of his anointing. Um, you know, what happens to leaders is often they feel drained when they don't continually draw on the power of the Holy Spirit. If we keep giving and giving and giving and we have no times of refreshing where we can draw on the Spirit of God, we get worn out because we try to then to go in our own strength. We can only go so far in the strength of what we've already done in the past. We have to continually keep putting the word in, putting the word in, putting the word in, spending time in prayer and in the presence of God. So this is like Jesus feeding the 500 with the three loaves and the two fishes. It just kept coming. He had two loaves and three fishes, but it was enough to feed 5,000 people. He never runs out. He always has enough. So in Malachi 4.5, it says that the spirit of God will be poured out on young men and they will prophesy and old men will dream dreams. Those never going to run out of the spirit. It, it even comes in the last days and he keeps talking to us and we keep seeing things. And I've been telling a certain person he needs to journal because God's been seeing been showing him a bunch of stuff. He doesn't write it down and then he forgets what God showed him. So God is actually, <laughs> they're all looking around and who, who might that be? So the quail are actually being blown in off of the Sinai Peninsula and they heap up. So this is what an omer is. Most of you have that in your Bible that they collect these omers. An omer is 10 quarts. So just one omer is 10 quarts of this quail. And the graves of greed is what that place is named, are graves of lust. So then in this next chapter, we see what happens with Miriam and Aaron and their grumbling. And so we're going to take a look. Miriam and Aaron began uh, criticizing Moses on account of the Ethiopian woman he had married, for he had, in fact, married an Ethiopian woman. Okay, so let's address this real quick. There's nothing in the scripture that tells us about this Ethiopian woman, but it is in the book of Jubilees. And I have absolutely read this. It talks about how when Moses left Egypt before, you know, when he was a young man and he ran away because he had killed somebody and he thought Pharaoh would find out, he first ran to Ethiopia before he went to uh, Midian. And in Ethiopia, he showed such wisdom and strength. They actually made him a leader and they gave him an Ethiopian wife as a present but she was not a Hebrew and she was not keeping Torah. And so he did not uh, consummate that marriage with her, but she has remained with him even when he went to uh, Midian and he married Zephora, that's right. So when he marries Zephora, he consummates that marriage and they have children, but he is not having 
relationships with this Ethiopian woman. She's still considered his wife, but he's not having relationships with her. And so Miriam and, and Aaron are offended over that. And sometimes we do that. We get offended for somebody else's sake. And sometimes we open up our mouth and we talk when it's somebody else's battle and we take it on and we get ourselves in trouble. So they criticized him about this Ethiopian woman. And they said, is it true that Ed and I have spoken only to Moses? Hasn't he spoken to us too? So they're busy having a conversation together, Aaron and Miriam. And they're going, okay, so he doesn't do everything right. And they're finding fault with him. I, um, I saw a post on Facebook a couple of weeks ago and it said, don't be surprised when God removes people out of your life. He was listening to the conversations about you when you weren't around. And so God ultimately protecting you by taking people out of your life. And I believe that. I believe there's conversations being had about us, not only by other believers, our uh, family members, or even people in the darkness of the dark kingdom. God will take care of those things for us. He's protecting us all the time. So they're having this little chat about him. And um, verse three, now this man, Moses, was very humble, more so than anyone on earth. So here's the humblest man on earth, and they're going to criticize him. And suddenly, Adonai told Moses, Aaron and Marion, come out, you three. So Moses doesn't necessarily know what they're talking about. But God does, he heard it. And he says, come to the tent of meeting. The three of them went out. And Ed and I came down in a column of a cloud and he stood at the entrance of the tent and he summons Aaron and Marion. And they both went forward. I'm, a, I'm afraid I'd be going, oh my God, what did I do? Yeah, yeah. And he said, listen to what I say. When there is a prophet among you, I add deny, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. That's how God speaks to me. He speaks to my heart. I hear things. I see things. I dream things. But it isn't that way with my servant Moshe. He is the only one who is faithful in my entire household. You want to criticize this guy? He is the only one faithful in this six million people out here plus. With him, I speak face to face and clearly, not in riddles. And he sees the image of Adonai. So why weren't you afraid to criticize my servant Moses? And the anger of Adonai flared up against him and he left. But when the cloud was removed from above the tent, Miriam had Hazarat, which we call leprosy, as white as snow. And Aaron looked at Miriam and she was as white as snow. Aaron said to Moshe, oh my Lord, please don't punish us for this sin. We commit it so foolishly. So he's looking at her, she's got leprosy. Don't you wonder? Uh, am I next? Yeah. What am I going to get? And then verse 12. Please don't let her be like a stillborn baby with its body half eaten away. And when it comes out of its mother's womb and Moses cried unto Adonai, oh God, I beg you, please heal her. And Adonai said to Moses, if her father had merely spit in her face, wouldn't she hide herself in shame for seven days? So let her be shut out of the camp for seven days. And after that, she can be brought back in. And Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days. And the people did not travel until she was brought back in. And afterwards, the people went on from Hatzerat and they camped at Paran in the desert. Whoa. You know, that's a Oh, yeah. Somebody just said these are all lessons for us. For sure they are. So how many remember what the anointing for the high priest was? 
It is the same ritual as someone who has leprosy to cleanse them from leprosy. So this is the possibility that Aaron had been anointed as a high priest. He had already been given the entire ritual of cleansing of the leper. It's like a preventive antibiotic or something to prevent him from even getting leprosy. He is the high priest. So if he is going to speak out of turn, God has already cleansed him ahead of time. To me, that reminds me of all the things that we do that through the blood of Jesus, we are cleansed for our ignorance. And God brings us to a place where we can repent and he does not judge us eternally for those things because of the blood of Jesus. It's already been applied. Every sin we have ever committed and every sin we're going to commit other than rejecting Jesus has already been covered far. That does not give us permission to do those things. But we are covered by the blood of Yeshua. And Aaron had already gone through the entire ritual. Remember where they put the, the, the blood on the ear and on the toe? Same thing for being cleansed from le a leprosy. Yeah, he still had a moment or two of concern. Oh, absolutely. I don't think he knew. I don't think that, that Aaron realized that he wasn't going to be exactly like Miriam. Yeah. Yeah. He began to repent immediately. Yeah. Okay. So this, this is something we need to realize that God hears our grumbling. Do you want to be called out by God? A prophet is spoken to differently than with Moses. He's spoken to face to face. He, he says he, he knows all of my faces. God knows everything about him. He knows his happy. He knows his anger. He, he knows everything that this man's going to do. And Moses understands the character of God. He says, I know every aspect of him. And he only understands and knows my character. So why are you not afraid to criticize my servant? We have got to be more cautious in being critical. This is considered the evil tongue, which in Hebrew is Lashan Hara. It always leads to death. When you have leprosy, you look like a dead person walking. And when you die, you lose your color. She was white as snow. So Moses does what he always does. He's a true intercessor. And he prays as if he had committed the sin. He prays in the first person as if he committed the sin himself. And Moses pleads for her. And at this time, he really doesn't know how long that she's going to have leprosy until God tells him seven days. Spend seven days outside the camp, pray, Think about what, you, what you're doing out here. How'd you get here? So in Leviticus 15, 8, only speak positively about others. Intercede as if you were praying for yourself. So here's things for us to do. Not grumble. To be content in whatever state that we are in. That's what Paul said. It doesn't mean that you don't attain to more, that in time you don't believe God to bless you, but it means that you have a grateful heart for whatever God has given you. Know that God hears your conversation. We will be giving account for every idle word that we have spoken. We're all in trouble. There are consequences for our actions, and we are to recognize that Yahweh is a provider for our needs and not always all of our wants. Sometimes we just have to have something. We get a craving for something. I mean, like chocolate, ice cream. I wanted ice cream really bad this week. 
I, I finally got sherbet and then it made me sick at my stomach. So not everything we want is good for us. So we crave it and we have to find a way to get our, our bodies under control. The things that this body wants are not supposed to be the most important things. It's what the spirit man is wanting and desiring. So Father, this is our prayer today, that you would help our light to shine like the light of a menorah, that we would reflect the eternal love of our great God and King, that you would allow the judging to be done by him, us, that, that we would allow God to be the judge and not ourselves. And that we would be content as we trust and believe God for whatever things that we have need of. Father, you are a great king. And we thank you, Father, for this word. And we pray that we would learn from this word. God, give us wisdom. Teach us how to walk in your footsteps. And we thank you, Father, that you have given us Yeshua. Father, none of us are going to walk this walk perfectly, but you have given it your son because you so loved us and you allowed him to take the punishment for our sins for us. And for that, we are eternal grateful and we desire so much to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our might. And we bless you. And Father, we say to those that are listening, Yahweh, bless you and keep you. Yahweh, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace from the Prince of Peace, the Shar Shalom, Yeshua HaMashiach. We bless you. We thank you for joining us and listening. Give us a thumbs up, share, and subscribe. And be blessed, and we'll see you next week. Amen.